In this video, we're going to restore the power supply and the analog board for the Mac SE30 project. While the power supply and the analog board for the Mac SE30 are currently working, they have some issues that are likely to cause a failure in the future. I'm especially concerned about the flyback transformer on the analog board. This can cause damage to other components if it fails. All of the insulation has been removed, so it could have some high voltage arcing issues. I'm also concerned about the reliability of electrolytic capacitors made during the era in which this Mac was made. So let's get them both recapped and we'll apply some high voltage Corona dope to the flyback transformer to give it some insulation. I'm going to try something new for you in this video. I'm always trying to find a balance between making a video for someone who's watching for the entertainment and for somebody who's trying to do this and work along with me. Generally, I edit a rough draft and then edit that down to a shorter video. So for this video, I'm going to try publishing the longer rough cut as an option that you can watch. It'll be unlisted, but the link is in the description below. Since we now need to disconnect and remove the CRT, it's critical that it be done safely. The glass envelope of the CRT is coated on the inside and outside to create a massive capacitor with glass in between as the dielectric. The inner coating is the anode while the outer coating is connected to ground. This can remain charged for some time after the machine has been turned off and unplugged, especially if the bleed resistor that's built into the flyback transformer has failed. This can hold tens of thousands of volts, so at best, you're going to get the shock of your life, and at worst, you could lose it. This machine has a fairly small CRT with an anode voltage of only about 13,000 volts. I mentioned in an earlier video in this series that I was going to get a proper discharge tool for the CRT. Unfortunately, I was unable to find one for less than about $150, and I did find information that indicated that this CRT is small enough to safely discharge with a homemade tool. I will include a link in the description to an awesome video by Branches Creations that specifically deals with discharging this era of CRT. After the CRT is discharged, you can safely remove the anode cap and then remove the analog board and power supply as we did in the first video in this series. Once I had removed the power supply from the analog board, I did a quick sketch of the capacitor locations, values, and polarity. Now let's get this board cleared of all the old capacitors that are no longer needed. I do want to apologize how long it took me to get to this video. Um, it's just a matter of I messed up my wrist and I had a lot of trouble editing. But for this video, I already had like four hours of footage in the editor off of two different cameras. So the time it was going to take me uh, to do the editing was just more than my wrist could handle all at once. So I've been doing it in little bits at the time. As you can see, there's just a ton of packed in caps there. In fact, I haven't even got a value for this one down in here yet, but we'll worry about that when we get to the power supply. Issue we have to deal with is as we looked at in the other video this pin so I'm just reflowing the solder and then just adding a little fresh solder to it so I'm just going to use some solder bra braid moving the wick over the pads until they look nice and clean you can see the wick getting solder in it so that tells you it's doing its thing And 
you look at the pads, they look nice and clean and ready to accept new parts. What I was saying is I've removed all the caps off the board except for the one that's unusual. This is the non-polaric cap. Then once that cap, all the other caps are ready to go, I'll get this one off and immediately replace it. That way the one that's unusual that may cause issues because I'm not familiar with it can get taken care of all at once. All the rest, I'm perfectly happy to do them in a batch. Um, if you're doing this for the first time, feel free to just do one cap at a time. Look at its position, take it off, put the replacement on exactly the same way, and then move on to the next one. There's nothing wrong with that. I did that a lot of times. Cap is out, and the replacement. So what I'm doing, so I've twisted it a little bit because if I put it in flat, it might get in the way of that connector and I don't want that to happen. Bazinga. All right, so now I'm gonna put all the new caps on. And again, this is a kit that I bought, but uh, you can source them yourself. Now, here's a great example. We're replacing a 1000 microfarad 16 volt cap with a 1000 microfarad 25 volt cap. If you're going from 16 to 25, as long as you're going to a higher voltage and you're not going crazy, you put a 400 volt cap in, you could have issues. But going from 16 to 25 volts is fine. That is the point at which the capacitor would fail or could fail from too much voltage. So you don't need to worry, but you can get into some more esoteric issues with, you know, say, like I said, a 400 volt cap. Um, there's some things like ESR that you can, you can have issues with. This is the one we just replaced. So modern capacitor technology tends to be smaller than the old stuff. So don't sweat it if the cap looks a lot smaller. That is just fine and dandy. and happy. Now I just gotta do one last thing. You know, I went to school for electrical engineering tech and not one time did they ever talk about cleaning your flux, cleaning your uh, flux residue off the board. All right, so the next step what I want to do is the flyback transformer on this is completely devoid of any kind of protection from uh, from corona arcing which I understand can be an issue. The other analog board the flyback literally has arcing and you can see little uh, tracks around the uh, top of the transformer. So the flyback here should have some insulation on here to protect it from uh, arcing from the inside. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna start and just cleaning the top of this flyback really well just to make sure that uh, the stuff we're putting on sticks. And what we're gonna be using today is called Super Corona Dope. So we're gonna be using some dope, man. Dope! And this stuff comes with more warnings than uh, just about anything I've ever used. Uh, harmful if inhaled, looked at, um, even if you uh, have some next door, it can kill you. Okay, maybe not quite that bad, but it sure, sure feels that way. Its purpose, though, is to act as a super insulator to protect things from, uh, from leakage, uh, that is, current leakage. I'm going to put on a pair of glasses. 
And then I have a disposable brush. It doesn't say anything about how to clean the brush and otherwise, so I'm just going to use an acid brush. A little bit of this. We'll just paint the whole top of this. And this smells exactly like model airplane dope when I was a kid, which is kind of hilarious. So we have a nice coating of the stuff. I am going to take this board and I'm going to put it out in the garage so that I'm not breathing these fumes to dry. <laughs> For this one, I have a cheat sheet here. This boy's had a lot of caffeine today. A lot of my friends would probably tell you how much I am not a Sony fan. I've just been hosed by them too many times in the past. But I have to say, this is a very nicely designed board. You can see wherever there's a cap, there's actually a marking on the board to indicate that it's a capacitor there. God, it would be a dream if that Amiga 3000 desolders as easily as this thing does, because this is fantastic. Parts are just falling out of here. So this last cap has huge contacts. So that C162, which is a very large cap. So we're gonna have to get a lot of heat on those big ground planes to get those off of there. So I am turning the soldering up to 425 Celsius. Now, if you're working on something like this, and you know, it's giving you a hard time, if you can just get one leg loose so that it, it's free, then you can just apply some heat to the other leg while gently moving the part until it comes loose. So, but there you have it. It is out of there. All right, the caps are all off. Now, one thing I like to do, large areas, I'll go ahead and reflow it. I prefer to do the reflowing before I put the new parts on, because if I don't, I'll get the new parts on, go done and forget to do it. So just heat it up good. Add a little tiny bit of fresh solder. The flux in the solder will just help it flow better and make sure there's a good electrical connection. You can also add a little bit of flux, but this board is just, it's absolutely flowing beautifully. Okay, so again, using a cap kit, looking at the old cap and the replacement, that the positioning of the pins is different. So this cap is not gonna fit in this space. And I'm going to try something. I don't know how well this is going to work. I'm going to try using a knurling bit on the Dremel instead of a drill bit. Bad idea? Hey, maybe, but we're about to find out. And then you can learn from my mistake if it's a problem. And for once, it kind of worked the way I imagined. It allowed me to remount that hole without making a huge mess. Didn't fit any better if you ask me. It looks perfect. Put the new cap in, negative to negative, positive to positive, goes just like that.
one, that one, that one, and that one. All right, there we go. We are recapped. Just one step left, and that's to clean up our mess. So now that the power supply is recapped, we'll put it all back together. So I added a thin film of thermal paste onto each of the thermal pads just to make sure we get good heat conduction. And now that everything's back together, we need to check the voltages. Go ahead and plug it in, turn it on, hooked up the meter. And for the meter, I'm just adjusting off of the five volts. And the five volt uh, line is, I believe, the orange wire with the black wires being the ground. Now when I checked it, I found it was at over 5.4 volts and that sounds really high. I mean, that's enough to fry chips. But the fact is it's probably fine at that because this power supply has no load on it right now. I am a little uncomfortable with that. I'm gonna drop it down to around 5.3 volts by adjusting the trim pot that's on the board using a non-conductive screwdriver. Do not use a metal screwdriver to do this. Took a little bit of tweaking, but I finally got it. And at 5.3 volts, I suspect when we have everything running um, with a load on it, we're gonna be at about 4.9, 4.95, somewhere in there, which is fine. As long as we're above four and a half volts, this machine should run just fine. All right, so those were the last pieces that needed restoration, so everything's ready to go together in the next video. I hope you enjoyed this video, and here's another one you might like. <laughs>